Howdy okay. everyone out there in Twitch land. Welcome back to Hex Hunter. I am Mokog and this is my friend Function and we are bringing you today the... Oh, uh, the general stand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Switching it up just for comedic sands. Today we want... <laughs> Here's our small talk for today. Small talk. Mokog is being bad at the internet. This is not a story. It just happens. So in any case, since the last time we were on, they finally dropped the Auction House patch, and they had a bunch of cool stuff on there. So, uh, aside from the two big meaty parts of the tournaments, they had Starter Trials, which were really nifty. I played through mine. Uh, have you played through your Starter Trials yet, Function? I've, I've actually only done one of them. I mean, like, one game. I haven't even, I guess the idea is that you play through a series of games, and at the end you get, like, a reward pack or something. Or yes. Or, like, so, a, a collection of cards. The way I found... Um, that it works is it looks like you go through three games and the first one you start with is you have to start with whatever the racial starter is mm -hmm. and then you're supposed to take those some of the cards that you get from the starter and then you know edit your deck a little bit you know make sure you get your stuff gemmed and then you play your next game then you get locks uh twice as many cards i think i think it either gives you five or six new cards for your second game and then after you win your third game you get a not an actual pack of cards, but it looks like I think it's a tailored pack of cards. Sure, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's what that's what I thought. So I did it just a little bit, and it seemed cool. It's definitely um, meant for players that uh, it's not meant for you or me for the most part. We might still have fun doing it, but if people are like, oh, it's really shallow, there's not a lot to it, um, well, that's because it's not really aimed for us. And really, it's aimed for the players that don't have any cards in their collection at all, or they have no idea about Hex. It's kind of like a mini tutorial maybe not really a tutorial but it's like a way to as soon as you get your beta key you can start mm -hmm. playing right away so that's definitely a, probably a problem for whenever they send out a wave of a thousand random keys to strangers yeah. and they log in they're probably overwhelmed at first especially if they're not like uh, tcg vets so it's i'm really glad they did this there are a couple of things i would have liked to see and i think one really big implementation i would have liked is um when you finish the game and it gives you new cards to add, it would be cool if it gave you like three different, I don't know, commons or something, however they wanted to balance it, and you got to pick one of them that you wanted to add to your deck, or two of them. Uh, I think that would be a good way towards, uh, for the new player getting them to understand it, like, you, you can choose what is added mm -hmm. to your deck kind of thing. I think maybe putting a choice in there would make it more interesting for new folks. and. Uh, the other thing is, it's kind of awkward that the very first game you need to play with one of the starter trials, which is good, mm -hmm. or one of the starter decks. But then right after that, you can use a completely different deck. Yeah, that's. The same thing. I think that kind of breaks a little bit of their theming. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, there's a couple things I would have liked to have seen with the starter trials. I think uh, a big one I really wanted to see on there is I would have loved to have seen an animation like where they pop up the cards for you. So, for instance, you get a, you know, I can understand a system message telling you what's going on. That's perfectly fine that you get in-game mail. But I think, you know, you want that interactivity for your starter trial. Because if you compare it to the starter experience for, let's say, oh, I don't know, Hearthstone? Mm -hmm. um, their intro experience, it's very, it's pop, It's it, it's got a whole lot of polish on there. And getting your first yeah. set of new cards... You know, it's a much more engaging experience than just a system message. Yeah, I think I I agree. Like, it, it obviously it could use a lot more polish, and Hearthstone's a great example because that uh, what Hearthstone is trying to accomplish, it accomplishes very well. And uh, this, oh, so pardon me, <clears throat> um, the starter trials are kind of um, targeted in the same direction as mm -hmm. what. Hearthstone in general is trying to do, and it's it's just trying to you know reach out to the casual players and provide them something, um, and provide people who are completely and totally new and oblivious to the genre at least a starting uh, point to jump off into. Um, but I think what we're talking about there, as far as polish goes, is probably an overarching theme of this entire patch. Mm -hmm. Is that with Cryptozoic or with Hex Entertainment being so small? Uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of patches like this where it's not going to be polished. It's just going to be, hey, this is what we have to give you now. And, you know, the next time we make a patch, hopefully it'll be a little bit better. And that's kind of what we've seen in the past so far. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be what we're going to be continuing to see. Yeah, it's not terrible by any means. It's just no. one of those where 
Uh, it's still beta, and I think one of the things Hex is definitely going to be battling is the uh, being in a not or the battle between the feeling of an early access versus a true beta versus mm-hmm. uh, essentially like a Blizzard beta. Where everything is, you know, that's a big perception they're going to have to fight because beta has been thrown around so often uh, Mm -hmm. out there in the marketplace. So if this is actually something we didn't have on the show notes and something that just popped into mind and I meant to add is that, so you're talking about beta and, you know, moving on different stages of development. Mm -hmm. um, And we're at like still almost even an alpha state in some senses, like they still have a lot left to implement. And, uh, or it's a very early beta, you might call it. And um, at, at what point uh, can they go from open beta to uh, release? Do, how much polish needs to be there uh, in order for that to happen? I don't think that's really a question I can answer. I mean, that's for the guys. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just interesting to think about, like, when, when would you individually be happy to see uh, them move from... Uh, open beta to release at least as far as implementation wise uh right now the auction house still needs some work and you know the starter trials like you're saying could use some more oomph to them and i think those are the kind of things that once those are polished and once those are closer to where we would like them to be is when they can start moving towards release at least uh most definitely i think if uh if you know we went to the forums and pulled up like the list of promised implementations and all that good stuff yay on the forums and everyone who's pulled that together uh you know the things that you definitely want to see before an open beta i would say you want to make sure that you do another pass in your auction house so mm-hmm. that it's a little bit more user friendly because it's it's designed to be friendly for a specific methodology of use so it's really friendly for whoever designed it it's not friendly for everyone now we yeah, have a lot even, of an, yeah we have a lot of analytical minds that figure it out, but it definitely needs some more user testing on it. Yeah, I don't even know if I would say it's friendly for anybody. It's not really supposed to be. It's it's just they're like, hey, we know we really got to get this in the game, and this is what we have currently, so we're gonna give it to you. And even uh, like the mods and whatnot in game chat were saying, yeah, we have a lot of stuff in the works. And I think Colin made a post on the forums that said, you know, they're already coding a lot of the fixes or adjustments and polish steps to the auction house so it, it's only going to get better from here yep um, so and that's one thing i would definitely want to see more on i'd like to see a little bit more uh, out of game so out of actual game animation very much like the polish they put on the wheel of fate so okay. i'd like the wheel of fate level of polish to starter trials i'd like to see that before we hit open beta i think oh i like would, yeah I, would, I, I think that would be immeasurably amazing for the yeah. game to be to have that, yeah, pre and post game, it would be really yep. cool. Um, you know, have uh, this is pretty simple, and I'm almost kind of surprised that they didn't put it in with what they did. Um, but yeah. having the because they already have like the art um, for it is the starter like the starter pack that you can buy in the store. Have that shown when you're picking what deck you're going to start the starter trial with. It'd be cool to just you know have extra little things like that because they might be small. And uh, at first, you might not seem like, oh, it doesn't affect the gameplay. I don't care about it. But a lot of those things um, subconsciously go towards your enjoyment of the game. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, so here's like, I we jumped over here to the store. And, uh, so we see like we got six things in the store. I know they always want a simple store when they're in their client, but you know the makeup of this is actually really beautiful. Uh, You know, Kismet's up here. It doesn't interfere with what you see in your top side. You know, Biplatinum is nice. It's prominent. It's got a cool graphic. Uh, When you mouse over the different items, you get a change over here to the right. Uh, You got your code redemption up here. What I'd love to see is if you come in, you click buy a starter, and I'd like to see it come up with an information be like, you know, hey, here's your starter. Here's all the cool stuff because they can pop up a window and it'll show you everything in that starter deck. Yeah. You know, you'll see everything that you get for it, which by yeah, the way I mean. is totally awesome because <laughs> how often do you get to see the exact uh, thing you're buying on MTGO online until you have to yeah. go get a resource uh, to go outside. So I love that they say, "Oh, you're getting a theory crafter, construction plans, and a Drew's colossal walker." The 
the other cool part about it is that you're not even um, just getting a list of cards. You're actually getting yeah. to look at the art and everything. Like yep. you're getting you can to see in. the full card beforehand. Yeah. Uh, you can zoom in. I think. Can you shard it? You can't. Uh, you can't put shards in the stuff that needs shards. But you know that you can get in there and see it is really cool. So you know we've got something awesome like this. I liked it to be one of those instead of where to figure out your starter trial, you have to jump into the proving grounds, and you'll get a third button right here that says, "Here, start your starter trial." Yeah. I think that should be one of those where you should get a system message after you buy a deck. And then after you immediately buy the deck, it should come up. Do you, would you like to do a starter trial or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, another option that, let's be honest, they're going, they have a little bit more insight on what the other options that they would like to have go on. But as soon as you buy that starter, you should have the option to do a starter trial and it just take you in. And for yeah, a brand I, new account, I think it should force you into it. Yeah, I agree, because they already have it set up, correct me if I'm wrong, that on new accounts, as soon as you log in, it says, hey, pick what deck you yep. want for free. And so, uh, I was going to say, like, it should just throw you straight into a starter trial, but if yep. they already have that, pick what deck you want for free, then you pick your deck, and then it should throw you into just one game, just that very first yep. starter trial game. And uh, they could tie in a lot of, like, tutorial stuff like you see in just a lot of games out there where you kind of have to click through it a little bit mm -hmm. um maybe which maybe you know, for some people and there you played that first game off. that first game was terribly terribly easy anyway you know yeah. it, it was definitely designed to be a starter experience to kind of get used mm -hmm. to like the turns and what things flash where like inside the game is not a problem that's you know that's you know it's got its beauty it's got its good design and it's good work it was one of those where, you know, you want to see those animations when you get the new cards because that's more satisfying than a system message. Uh, I think it would be a really cool idea that, like, uh, to take the being able to choose mm -hmm. option that you had. I think it would be really good to apply that to the final win and say you have your choice between one of three Shin Hair yeah. starter packs. One oh, of three okay. human starter packs. And sure. each one has a slightly different build. They could take the deck in a slightly different direction. So it could be like one. Of, you're talking like in the final when you yep. when you get like your your tailored one. So it could be like you're choosing between three different rares, which all aren't really chasey rares, but they're ones that could build your deck in a different direction. They all tie mm -hmm. in, and maybe each of those rares comes with a couple commons or uncommons that also tie into that same card. And yeah, I like. Well, that the idea. the starter pack is a 15 card pack. It's designed yeah. to be like a booster. So you get oh, okay. a rare three uncommons and then uncommons. It's just that those commons and uncommons are tailored to the specific starter deck it comes from. Okay. So what what I think would be really fun, especially to kind of get this choose your own style sort of way, is mm -hmm. you know you get some really basic in uh, upgrades in your first trial, some more advanced upgrades in your second trial, and I think the after your third trial win, you should really show the diversity that you can do within each of the tribes essentially. Because, you know, in Shin yeah. Hair, you can go the super growth route with mass swarms and growing. You can go yeah. the, you know, the blood destroyer route. Or you can go with the kind of stompy wild route or just the burn blood route. And just yeah, have Shin Hair I, as this kind of a, you know, a side portion of it. And even so if, if it's just two, do, you know, I think that yeah. would add a lot of uh, depth to it. Yeah, so if you're going to do, like, the, the Shin Hair 3... You're saying uh, you could do a swarm one, and maybe the rare you get in there is like onslaught or something. You could do um, the sacrificing one, mm -hmm. so that's like it could be like, like hop hero and stuff. or ritualist. So maybe you or... get hop hero for the rare. Yep. And then we're talking maybe like a burn one, and I would say like life siphon, and mm -hmm. then the other card that lets you sacrifice guys. That's two rares. Yep. But um, you could you could figure something out there. If, and if you know, because the other part or of it dinosaurs is in. with yep. one, Yeah. Uh, and another good one would be the reason that you do that is because then it gives other players a reason to go in and you want to make those decent rares maybe not the super chase yeah. stuff but decent because then there's another reason to go in and drop another thousand platinum yeah so not necessarily uh, someone who was in a part of the Kickstarter but maybe someone who wants to come in uh, drop 20k platinum uh, get a couple starters you know, maybe they really, really like the Shin Hair, and maybe one of them's an Azume in one of those. You know, Azume is a really yeah. good Shin Hair card, but it's very Shin Hair focused. If you yeah. could get one of those at the end of your starter trial, but you had to choose between which one, you know, you've like got that. a reason to yeah. go back and get another one. 
But you yeah, know, no, then like you got a, a tournament staple like Life Siphon. And it's good for um, uh, conditioning people towards like acquiring more cards, kind of thing. So, so which is always good. You know, I, um, so they we both know we yeah we agree on that one. They've got work to do. Uh, yeah. Now let's see. One of the other things so that they are implementing was the big tournaments, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, did you have a chance to play in any of the big tournaments? They started at the absolute worst times for me. Okay. Uh, because when they first go off, uh, they went off at 11 o'clock our time for the first one that we could get into. And they're like, we're starting the first one here in 15 minutes. And I'm like, I'm at work and I have another hour to like even dream of going on lunch and working from home. There's not a chance in Intrath that I'm going to be able to hit this one. And then I'm like, um, four hours yeah. later, I'm like, oh, it's five. Is this one full? Oh, it's full. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah. They, they were filling up quick. So, which is exciting because mm -hmm. they were 128 player tournaments. That means there were 128 people online, assuming that there weren't people queuing up multiple times with different accounts or something, which maybe well, one or two you. people might have done. But, uh, you know, um, yeah, I, I was able to get into two of them. Uh, I got into the very first one. And I did pretty well. I think I made one or two misplays that probably cost me a game. I don't think I, um, or no, actually mm -hmm. I didn't. I the only game I lost, the only round I lost was in uh, the very first round, and I lost against somebody who ended up going 4-0 playing a Sapphire Ruby. Um, I guess the Gore Storm deck is what people are calling it, um, with like Mirror Knight, Mentalist, and Polka, and those all kind of chain together and draw you a bunch of cards. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm playing a. a three-color okay. control deck. Um, I am going 3-1 in the tournament, so I got some packs and stuff. Uh, the cool thing about the tournaments is uh, this isn't a permanent thing, it's just while mm -hmm. they're testing them, because there's a lot to work out with it, is yeah. they're all free, and there are prizes, so um, yes. it encourages people to join, and I would say, even if you think you have no chance of winning, it's good experience to just jump in there and do it. It's free, and hey, you might get lucky, and you mm -hmm. might win some packs, because I uh, managed to snag some. Um, so while I was in that one, the uh, the next tournament, which was going to fire four hours later, um, it opened up for registration mm -hmm. right when the first one started, and so it filled up on very very quickly. Uh, by the time that I was done with round four, it was already full, and I wasn't able to get in. Um, and then I hear that there were a lot of bugs with that one. The first tournament we had very few bugs, so it seemed like it kind of steamrolled a little bit. Mm -hmm. Going into um, and I should say also about the first tournament is, uh, please, if you haven't done one yet, uh, you should remember to build a sideboard for your deck, because I yes. did not, and that cost me a little bit. Um, I, so I jumped right in with a deck that didn't have a sideboard built. But uh, going naughty, into the naughty. third tournament, going into the third tournament, I uh, changed my deck. Well, I registered for it, because you can mm -hmm. register for the tournament well ahead of time, and then go do other things. You can use the auction house, or deck builder, or open packs, or whatever else you want to do. The problem is, if you change your deck list at all, after you've registered, uh, it causes bugs with the entire tournament for basically everybody. Oh, wow. If just one player did that. Um, and so that kind of snowballed very quickly. I don't even know. Well, no, that tournament finished, but it definitely had a lot of issues. I had times where in the very first round, um, before it even started, it gave me a round, a match loss. Um, oh, wow. So I had to uh, win the next two, which I did. I uh, won them pretty well, and then I went into the next round, I did all right, um, but the problem was it was taking so long with so many bugs uh, and everything that I just dropped at that point to go get some food and stuff, um, and I hear it, it, it finished a couple hours later, but uh, the tournaments are four rounds, so you should mm -hmm. definitely set aside about four hours or so to do them. Um, they're going to be a little bit faster than that, they should be, uh, but you should at least budget yourself the time just in case it does go long, um, and they were a lot of fun. You know, and if you take a look at if you get a full 128 players, I believe uh, after four rounds, you sh ideally would have four players with 4-0 uh, undefeated records, right? Because it's um, divided by two each round, bam, 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 in those tiers, correct? It's eight players. You yeah, divide so it by 16. For every 16 players, there's somebody who uh, goes 4-0. So. Okay. But, uh... So, you know, the thought about it, that is, though, is that it should give a pretty good opportunity for a, uh, a set of players to, uh, well, essentially, their 128-person tournaments easily lead into a standard top eight regular tournament. Mm -hmm. So, 
hopefully that'll mean that they are pretty good on having their standard code uh, take care of the top eight. Yeah, well, I mean, with, with 128, yeah, there's no need for um, a top eight or anything. But as they had these, like, big end of season or maybe end of month or VIP tournaments, mm -hmm. and those are cutting to top eight, yeah. Or maybe these 128 tournaments award points, and if you accrue a certain amount of points, it qualifies you for another tournament, which is uh, what I expect to see, what I hope to see, and what I'm excited to see. I would expect also that maybe um, the on-demand queues would award one point as well, mm -hmm. uh, possibly, which would be really nice. It's too bad they, they're not already, because it would be nice for me to be racking up the points. <laughs> uh yeah especially oh that would be it also if they were able to start up the uh the point system for even something that maybe not necessarily like in prep for hexcon but just like a special vip setup so that we can get a little bit more uh constructed fun stuff going on and the angel mm -hmm. dons love me on this fun game um, yeah oh. and there goes the puppy oh no um what was i gonna say so we were looking at you you mentioned it just a second before the dog park. What were you saying? Um, oh, VIP stuff. Yes. That's another thing that they alluded to coming very shortly. It'll be the next patch or two. Uh, we can expect there to start being VIP tournaments. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then as far as other patch-related stuff that we got, um, there were a couple small UI changes or alterations on cards, as well as um, the auction house. The auction house is the big thing. Yes. I think that's probably our next topic that we're going into yes so the uh the auction house has been i i guess awesome is not the perfect word but absolutely needed and loved for its utility i think is probably the best description i'd give for it right now so well, the that's... you know we'll jump over here to the auction house so mm -hmm. the auction house it's you know the ui is i wouldn't say it's a super polished ui but its UI is definitely serviceable, and I have seen worse things come out of uh, larger companies, most definitely. Uh, its sorting selection is still in want, and I think that, uh, and that's, we alluded to that when we were talking a little bit about uh, the design that was done for it has not been fully implemented yet. And uh, I'm glad we've got a, a source like Colin being like, yes, they understand, they are fixing it. But we mm -hmm. hollered so bad to get it now, we are getting it now. Yeah. So, which means that if you have a comment to put on the forums, go put your comments on the forums. This is a company who actually listens to you. I think, I, I can't stress that enough because I was having that argument today with one of my buddies who uh, also backed Hex. Uh, mm -hmm. Because he's got an aversion to jumping on the forums because he's like, they don't listen. I'm like, no, they listen. You know why they yeah. listen is because they, the people who are backing them are actually like family this it's so hard to get yeah. that through heads and you know they'll give you stuff like the auction house as it is now where you know like alpha it wasn't perfect but you know all the upgrades we got at the end of alpha going into beta were fantastic so yeah. uh and i mean even in game like they have the um there's hex rex and mm -hmm. there's the nobles uh yep. kind of like the um they're I, in I here i guess we call them yeah, the, the moderators of the channel. Yes. And, uh, you know, that they'll take a lot of the input and bring it back to the team or they'll be able to answer questions. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that I see people maybe complaining about on the forums are actually things that already have some sort of solution. Um, and actually, it was Rex was saying earlier, a good way to put it is most of the complaints, if not all the complaints about the auction house, currently have a workaround. Uh, that doesn't mean that the complaints aren't... Uh, aren't valid they're most of all of them are totally valid because it's all like hey this is really clunky what do i do here kind of thing and mm -hmm. so there's this roundabout clunky way to to go about it um it's not ideal but at least you know you can kind of take the extra time to come up with a solution yeah. but they are well aware that uh some of these things could use some some fixing true that but you know one of the big things about the uh auction houses in general is that you know when you get down to the nitty-gritty is can you find items how do you find items and how much are you paying for stuff because let's be honest ebay is ebay because it's easily searchable which mm -hmm. we all like but also it's got cool stuff on it yeah and so you know and let's be honest there's a bunch of cool stuff on uh the auction house at the moment there's also yeah. normal stuff like mazat rangers and inquisitions well uh, on the note of normal stuff and of cool stuff, uh, on the normal stuff, 
n note. I've been pleasantly surprised. I've been selling, uh, I don't know, a couple dozen commons and mm -hmm. um, probably like 50 or 60 uncommons at the, the floor price. So there is a floor, which is kind of awkward, but it's not. I don't think it's all that bad. Um, you probably have some opinions about that, though. Uh, is that commons, the cheapest you can sell them for is uh, three bid, four buyout, and with mm -hmm. uncommons it's ten bid, eleven buyout, and I've sold a lot of uh, uncommons for eleven cents, um, which is kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. So every time you open a pack, um, you can say, well, there's at least thirty cents of uncommons in there. That goes towards yep. a factoring of the price of the booster and all that kind of mathematical stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, not all of them sell, but I sold a ton of them, and I made a couple hundred platinum off of it. And hey, it's just extra platinum I can put towards buying an Angel of Dawn or something like that. So yep, that's kind of yep. nice. Uh, and so, like the floor side of it, that so the company is basically going when you see a price floor like that, and especially one that you can't even manually push down, they're going mm -hmm. an uncommon is worth this much. Uh, yeah. When you go to a uh, a legendary, I believe the lead floor on a legendary is fifty platinum, and the floor on an epic is a hundred platinum. Mm -hmm. So it means that. You know, any time that you want to unload your uh, alternate arts uh, windborn acolytes, it's a hundred mm -hmm. platinum. So you know that's the uh, the draft price of a pack at the moment. Or actually, draft price sure. of a pack is a little higher than that. But yeah, uh, you know the floors guarantee a certain layer of value, and so it it does create a little bit of uh, stability. But what we're going to see just as with commons and uncommons, they're going to just drive towards that floor until there's something else that gives them value. Yeah. Uh, so and that and that's going to happen until we get uh, another okay. use for them outside of PVE. Which actually, so say you were to argue that the floors are the worst thing ever, that they are invented okay. by the devil and they need to be removed. And that say you were to say that and you had a really strong argument and, and there was basically no argument otherwise that yeah, you were right. They are the devil, and they need to leave. It it might even still be a good thing now that they do them until there's that alternate way of uh, alternate use of cards, and mm -hmm. we're presuming that's going to be crafting. That they didn't want uh, players to fall into a trap of selling all their stuff now and then being like, ah, wow, well, I sold all my stuff, and you didn't tell me about crafting, and now that crafting is out, they're worth way more than I sold them for, kind of thing. So probably mm -hmm. uh, having the the common player avoid that kind of thing um, is probably ideal. Uh, that is extremely true. The one thing to I would say the blah blah blah. So to add to that, because I want I took a look at some auction house theory and auction house game theory fairly recently to kind of brush up on mm -hmm. it, because there's only so much that you can remember from college <laughs> when it was seven yeah. years ago. Um, one of the big things about auction house theory is that in most efficient auctions you can have the price go down to as low as feasible and allow the bids to go up as high. So that basically allows anyone who comes in to do the auction to get the most efficient price and then mm -hmm. the uninvested seller gets the, the true price of the item. And they consider yeah. that the efficient and I'm totally butchering the definition of an efficient uh, auction house, but that's the general gist of it. Uh, the price floor is actually an implementation for all sellers so every seller appreciates the price price floor because though it limits your number of buyers mm -hmm. it guarantees a cash flow from the product so sure. the price floor is an implementation from hex to the people who own cards and go you have a guaranteed price floor for this you have a guaranteed price floor flow for this uh, mm -hmm. So whether it's an uncommon, a rare, or a legendary, or an epic, it's going to have a minimum value, which means that whoever's going to be looking at it will eventually find out very quickly that no matter what, you're going to be paying this much for it. So It's at least worth something. Yeah, it's not even just that it's at least, at least worth something. It's also a time saver to, once the knowledge is known, to anyone who's not willing to spend it all. Or sure. for someone who wants to only spend 29 platinum to buy a rare... Well, you're not going to be able to get it. Okay. You know, so yeah. you have to spend yeah. your 30 platinum. You have to have your 30 yeah. cents to get it. Uh, I get what you're saying. So in that case, 50 cents for your epics or 50 cents for your legendaries and then your dollar for your epics. Uh, if you don't have that platinum, you're not going to get it. That's an incentive actually for them to get platinum into the system. Yeah. So Cryptozoic benefits 
from that side of it. The sellers benefit from having a reason to have a continuous amount going on and not have your commons and uncommons drain down to zero. Because that's what's going to happen in a digital game without a price floor. Mm -hmm. So what a, one thing that I think I would really like to see on kind of base implementation, we're, ta we're talking about price floors and stuff, is um, the bidding, not the buying out process, but just the bidding process, I think is really awkward right now. Mm -hmm. um, you click the bid button and it bumps it up by just one platinum or one gold. Uh, you can enter a number in there, like if it's at 500 and you enter 700, well now it changed the bid to 700. I would really, really like them to, to do it so that you said my maximum bid is 700 and if it's currently at 500 and the maximum bid currently is at, is also 500 so that was somebody else's maximum bid, it only goes up to 501. That I'm, I'm sure there's a name for that type of bidding um, and hopefully it makes sense mm -hmm. what I'm getting at is that it only ever uh, sells for what the the second highest bidder is willing to pay, basically, and then the highest bidder is the one who gets it. So that's a uh, that's a really good point. So for instance, just as a quick show, I did a a fifty platinum bid on a profit of a uh, load again, just because it's mm -hmm. profit of load again. I'll you know fifty cents for uh, everyone to watch. So as we notice, it you know went from like thirty platinum to fifty one platinum. Mm -hmm. So in that style, it's actually uh, operating as a silent auction style. So mm -hmm. the silent auction, you don't know who's coming in, you're looking at it, bam, you put in your price, and the person who comes around next time has a chance to come in and do the same thing. So they're taking the silent auction style. Um, mm -hmm. The eBay style for an interactive auction house, like this appears to be, because we don't have like the trappings of a silent auction. Because mm -hmm. in the silent auction, you have everyone's pseudonym who's bid before you, so that you know who's bidding on what. And so the trade-off for you putting in a bid of what you're willing to pay at that point is you know what everyone else was bidding at that point in time and you gain that information mm -hmm. which gives you aside from just you know good feelings of understanding who's bidding on what you get a lot of good information from silent auctions that allows sure. the community to kind of gel together well we don't have that here and that's a pain in the butt to implement on top of that yeah so uh but what we expect when we look at this apparatus is an ebay style of auction mm -hmm. house that is exactly what you described where it's yeah only going to get forced up to your maximum bid amount mm -hmm. when someone else is willing to bid on it. Now, yeah. the other side of this is uh, it is better for sellers. Yeah. It Well, you mean it's currently better for sellers yes, right now? This is, or this is presently evil? better for sellers. So the silent auction style I would say, I would is disagree. designed to uh, create the most revenue possible. So okay. uh, it is designed for the gathering of essentially the gathering of coin. Because you put uh -huh. in whatever you're going to do, and that's what you pay. Yeah. And so when the next person comes along, if they're willing to put more value down on the table, they put all of their value down. It's a more you're, efficient you're way gaining. of clearing sure. it. Uh, it takes more personal time to recreate the eBay method. But the yeah. seller benefits. Okay. So, so the, the one... Okay, well, this is more of... This is actually is not what you're talking about. This is more of kind of a... A, a dummy's guide to it is what I was about to say because um, what you're saying I was going to disagree with it but no what you're saying is totally true what I'm about to get up get at is just a flaw in the implementation maybe or um, something else mm -hmm. that you can probably tell me so I one of the very first auctions I posted was a primal pack I wanted to see what I could sell it for yep. and I made a really big mistake in doing so I posted it at the price I wanted for the buyout I thought um, I looked at what they were already going for and I went a little bit lower than that. Turns out they've dropped a lot since then. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I posted a, a, a buyout that turns out to be uh, higher than market value. I also forgot to put something in the bid column and uh, luckily I, I found a solution about this. But So the bid on that was then one platinum. Uh, in this case, because the auction house, you can't see all the auctions at once, you can only mm -hmm. see 15 and you have to sort through them kind of awkwardly. There's a way to kind of narrow it down with filters and whatnot, yep. but nobody was seeing the auction. And so then somebody right away bid one platinum on it. So now my, my primal pack, which I was hoping to get you know, $15 for, mm -hmm. I was now gonna get one cent for. Uh, and as soon as somebody has bid on something, you can no longer cancel the auction which was the very first thing I tried to do when I realized what I did, but it was already too late, less than 60 seconds later. 
uh, which it kind of sucks. There, maybe there should be a cooldown. I'm totally fine with them saying, hey, you can't cancel auctions once they've been bid on, mm -hmm. but it would be really, really nice to say, except for this five minute window right after you post them um, to correct those kind of mistakes because that was a genuine mistake and it, it sucked. Um, luckily in this case, I asked somebody else to say, hey, would you at least bid $10 on this? Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if I don't get um, any other bids on it, if it says that, that once trading something, I'll just give you the 10 bucks back. And it's yeah. the, to me, the primal pack is worth more than that. So yeah. I would um, like that. And that's what we did. But for other people, uh, maybe that didn't have that option available or didn't think of it, that's really unfortunate. Because I could, with the way the auction house currently operates and how it's kind of clunky, I could have seen that primal pack easily going for 200 platinum or something. Um, just yeah. because the, the bidding increments are so awkward and like we're, it's a problem of maybe the silent auction. Yeah, the uh, it's not the bidding increments is not necessarily a problem of the silent auction. It's that uh, you don't have a huge incentive to bid more than the minimum. Yeah, and that's the concession to the buyer in the silent okay. auction. Uh, so the when a bid war starts in a silent auction, a lot of value goes to the seller. But when there's not a bid war in a silent auction, a lot of value goes to the buyer. And that's the, the give and take of a silent auction. Uh, so the bid war kind of provides some liquidity to it, maybe, is a term you might use. And or it makes it like kind of it, it makes it work better, I would say, in some senses, as long as it's still accurate and nobody's inflating the price. Um, the problem is it's I think it's hard right now for there to be a bid war in the first place. Uh, you have to be watching it, and it's because you don't have... Uh, what would create a bid war is once you get less than a certain number of time, I would say in current implementation, I'd say less than six hours. Mm -hmm. uh, the A ticking time clock incentivizes quicker bidding. Sure. So what we have yeah. now is a, basically a bid and leave it scenario. Yeah. And the bid and leave it scenario is better for the patient buyer. Uh, because, yeah. you know, if you're willing... You need to be willing to buy it and if you don't win it walk away wait for the next one uh mm -hmm. and so i think that's and that's really a limitation of the current implementation so, yeah and i'm trying to see if there are any primal packs on there may not be uh primal packs on right now okay so uh the problem right now is you have item rarity set to rare oh that would probably do it primal. also another <laughs> another problem is that the price there max uh it's probably sometimes um Shoot, what was I going to say? The the price max option. Sometimes it sets itself to zero after you've cleared it, and so it doesn't show you anything. Um, that's always kind of wacky. Well, yeah, let's, but, let's yeah. see what the... We'll, we'll go high. Let's see what the uh, highest price we see going. Someone's wanting to demand for a... Well, I, I see one there that somebody's asking $200 for one. Yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> so, and I mean, that could be uh, some... My very... My second auction, actually, no, this was the first one, the primal pack I listed. I added an extra zero because I was bad at math in that moment, and guinea pigs are making a lot of noise. They want food right now. It's oh, okay. Um, but what were we saying? So, um, but yeah, things. Uh, on an awesome note, I just sold an alternate art Azawa for $45, which nice. is more than I valued it at, so I'm happy about that. But somebody was happy to buy it, so. I guess it's a win-win situation for both of us. Hey, Mythic. Welcome, Mythic. Um, let's... I don't think everyone just suddenly bought all of the... I had primals and then they were gone. We're, we're going to pop out of the auction house and pop back. I think it's probably experiencing a small error. Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on. I don't know, but... uh, Yeah, you had some going there. Primal What? Packs. What generally... I don't change the item rarity at all. I just type in primal in the search outcome and that that's at least less uh less likely to mess you up oh apparently searching for primal is not a good idea at the moment so yeah just do item rarity at any and type in the word primal it came up on the first time i did it huh. oh well oh is your your price max is set to zero it also that came up on Crown of Primals on this last one. Yeah. Anyways. Um, 
And so this is what we talk about fun. when we're talking about clunky searching. Yeah. That, I know I'm looking at packs. We, there were a bunch of primals on there just a few moments ago. Here, let's... Huh. Yeah, I don't let's know. Let's go ahead and search that. all cards, because I know it can search. See, there's Crown of Primals. Now, if we go to packs... You know, let's take it down to, let's say, 5000 because we knew some were selling for yeah. 50 bucks. Hmm. Buyouts only? Nope. Zero search yeah. results. That's kind of crazy. Getting back to other stuff, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's... The, the auction house clearly has uh, some issues with it, and they need to be worked out. That or um, its packs portion just crashed for some reason. Yeah. But, uh, um, so, you know, one of the things before I got terribly sidetracked by Primal Packs, the I think one of the things they could do when you're doing your listings is when you create an auction, it needs to go ahead and give you a... Uh, another pop-up window, not just to confirm that your auction's listed, but one that goes, you are doing this card for this amount and this buyout. Are you sure? Yeah. And go through. And I think they should do that for every platinum auction. Not necessarily gold. Maybe gold be a little bit buyer beware. But yeah. definitely for every platinum because you're dealing they with a real money equivalent. They should do it for gold too, in case you meant to list it for platinum. I've seen a lot of people uh, say that they accidentally did that, and that really is unfortunate. If you yes. sold a, a an angel for you know a hundred gold, which is not worth anything, or or whatever you might have done, and I know people have already done that, so that is unfortunate for them. Uh, I would like there to be that, um, and maybe an option to turn it off because it does add mm -hmm. um, posting time to it, and it's already kind of clunky. Uh, but what I would really like to see is just an option, like I was saying, in the first five minutes of posting something, even if it gets a minimum bid on on it, that you can still cancel it. Yeah, um, I maybe think that would at a, least solve some of that. Some of maybe that. a timer on your auction that's uh, maybe like let's say a two minute timer. I think two minutes yeah. might be you know a good. Oh my god, I just screwed this up, and just have it mm -hmm. click down so that when you you know run over here to my bids, uh, and it loads up, you'd be like, oh, I've got this many things. Uh, and that can especially be really good for instances where you didn't mean to drop a thousand platinum. Yeah. Uh, and it come up with a, you know, and it might be a good idea to put it on like thresholds. It's there's because mm -hmm. there's a difference between thirty platinum and a thousand platinum. There's a difference yeah. between a thousand platinum and ten thousand platinum. Because let's be honest, once Angel of Dawn runs out of print and goes into whatever Hex's version of Legacy is going to be. If Hex has a version of Legacy, maybe Angel of Dawn do become worth a hundred bucks. Uh, I, well, I doubt it, but on this you know, you side talk copy, down the line. Uh, Angel is not the, the type of card that that will be. It'll always be a good card, but it's never going to get much better than it currently is. Did, did I lose you? No, no, you didn't uh, lose me. Sorry. It was just, yeah, uh, uh, it, it, I can't argue the future on that because, yeah. you know, Almost all of my TCG experience has been with uh, what I would call a fresh TCG. The one that mm -hmm. hit the, the largest number of sets hit, I think, seven sets, which is just... And the way they designed it was actually very good for integrating them all together into a play environment. Mm -hmm. And they sure. tried to design it that way. So it never actually hit the uh, a block cycle rotation like uh, a lot of other successful TCGs have, like WoW and Magic and uh, some of the others. And so what that means is that I have very little experience for the transition of states. And that's actually where I'm doing mm -hmm. a lot of my personal research is going in and seeing what was playable and standard in Magic, how it transitioned to modern, how it transitioned to legacy, how it transitioned uh, across each of these realms and what the valuations look like across the way. Because, you know, a card that may yeah. look terrible now could be absolutely amazing later on. Yep, that's one thing we were talking about. So in Angel of Dawn's case, the big drawback is that in in some games, uh, in either games where it's in your opening hand or in games where you uh, are playing a deck that relies on drawing a bunch of cards, Angel has a very high potential to just be a 4-4 steadfast flight for mm -hmm. 5, which in, I would say, eternal formats, is not very great. Um, it doesn't bring a lot to the table on its own. It's vulnerable, and it 
is expensive. That's the biggest drawback, that if you're playing troops, you want them to be efficient and fast in Eternal Form as for the general, or be very, very resilient and, um, you know... Yeah, the angel is not the most resilient. So. Uh, every, yeah, ain't, like, if it came in with Spell Shield, that would be a different story. Oh, yeah, it would be bonkers. I mean, it, it already is bonkers. It's very good, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, and it has... Uh, anytime you can cheat a card into play, what is it, that's exactly what Angel is doing. You're, mm -hmm. In a sense, you're playing it in some way you would not ordinarily be able to do so. It's going to be really good. So in that sense, that's where it has some extra value. If uh, you're able to abruptly end your opponent's turn off of sacrificing a troop, and then you could put it back on top. I don't know, some kind of weird shenanigans combo or something like that. It might still be good. But uh, Angel, it's, it's always going to be decent. And uh, it'll be an iconic card, but true. Uh, once once it rotates out, I expect it'll probably lose some of its value. Vampire King's an iconic card as well. Yes, very. Yes. Yeah, people people really like the Vampire King. I've been playing some of those and constructing. They're pretty good. But uh, what what is our? Uh, I think actually Vampire okay. King's going to be a really cool foil. Sorry, I I, I get yeah. sidetracked by Vampire Kings. So it will be pretty a, good for. You know, and yeah. this kind of leads a little bit in like our kind of our observations on what valuations have been for like uh cards for gold and platinum and because okay. earlier today i put out uh, a couple tweets kind of asking you know if you've got like a really good deal go ahead and you know get it out here on twitter i'd really like to see what people are seeing and valuing valuing as good deals or also like how much are you uh seeing for like the gold to platinum ratio on cards uh, and I'd like to take a, a second to kind of explain how some of that works, and I think probably okay. the best way would be to take a look at alternate arts. Okay. That you can. Uh, so we'd want to take a look at alternate arts that you can get from uh, actually the use of gold. Okay. And so a, a good example of this is a Windborn Acolyte right now, because it's an epic, being an epic alternate art, uh, and being a common one that you hit fairly often, you know, once you got a hundred common chests, you're pretty much guaranteed at least a place that a windborn acolytes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really good at going. How much gold are people willing to ask for one of these? How much platinum are people going for? Well, you know, hundred platinum increments makes division really easy. <laughs> yeah. So and you go okay. So now what's you know if the average price is going to be a hundred, which is what it appears to be for most windborn mm -hmm. acolytes. Uh, how much gold is a Windborn Acolyte going for? Because it's good 1-1 one, one flyer, it's going to look pretty foil, it's also an alternate art. It's going to have at least a, mono, uh, a monochrome amount of uh, desirability. It's not going to be the same kind mm -hmm. of scaling that you would get with like a Wrathwood. Because the, mm -hmm. uh, the rare Wrathwood Colossus, I've sold one of those for 125k, and its platinum value was only about $6. And that sure. really skews my numbers because if I go by that, you know, I had essentially pull up my handy dandy calculator here. You got 125k, and you, it's worth six uh, 600 platinum. You know, that's over mm -hmm. 200 uh, gold to a platinum. Okay. But when you go take a look here at Windborn Acolyte, like this one right here for 7500, well, that's just 75 to one platinum. Drastically different. Mm -hmm. If we start taking a look at our Let's uh, we'll switch this to gold only. Bits. So, let me let me interrupt here on the windborn mm -hmm. acolyte. In this case, you're comparing the seven. I would say almost in some ways, if they were a ton of Wrathwood Colossuses listed, which mm -hmm. there there aren't, but if there were, uh, that might be the better example, wouldn't it be? Because in this case, the windborn acolyte, the platinum price you're seeing, um, it, it being a hundred might not be what it's worth. We don't know if those are actually selling at a hundred. I would suspect they're they're probably not. They, but I have no way of knowing. So, if if the ones being listed at a hundred aren't actually selling, then realistically, maybe the the windborn acolyte price, the most somebody would pay platinum wise for it was sixty or something. Mm. We're just throwing a number out there. But it's on. You can't list it at that price. It, doesn't that provide a problem for for your? Uh, well, your experiment here? what you're doing is you're looking for bounds because mm -hmm. you can always find an instance, but you want to find your upper bound and your lower bounds before mm -hmm. you start trying to really take a look at what your functions <laughs> are going mm -hmm. to be uh, in between. And so okay. now, because if you take a look, what is the true amount of platinum you have to spend for the minimum amount of gold? Well, mm -hmm. if you ask yourself about a draft for a draft for $1 in platinum plus three packs that you should have anyway, 
uh, you get at least 5,000 gold. So if you take a look, at that's a 50 to 1 ratio. And if you put in the time investment to win, you're getting 20k out of that with your skill. So mm -hmm. your 20k to your 1 platinum, you get the 200 range. So that's mm -hmm. 200 to 1. But the mm -hmm. difference is, is that you have that sunk cost of time in between that kind of fiddles sure. and plays with it. But, you know, the no time version of that is 50 to 1. So ideally, okay. you shouldn't see a Windborn Acolote's gold price deviate much further than dropping from a draft and rare drafting. Because okay. the most efficient way to get gold for one platinum or for 100 platinum is a draft. Mm -hmm. Now, the other so side. So you're kind of, of setting that. I, I kind of get what you're getting at. And I think now, this some only of it's exists, probably going over my head. Yeah, this only but. exists right now because of Kickstarter rewards. Yeah. Because the other way to look at that is once Kickstarter rewards are finally all gone, which we're nowhere near having happened yet, uh, it's actually 700 platinum for everything from the store to 5,000 gold at present mm -hmm. until they take away gold rewards, which will happen one day. Okay. Hoard your gold, everyone. Um, just like in real life, hold your, hoard your gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. But if you take the auction house price of packs, which is a much truer market value, it's 400 platinum maybe 500 platinum give or take a little bit of volatility so 500 to a thousand so that's actually 500 5000 that's a 10 to 1 mm -hmm. yeah that's a 10 to 1 ratio so 10 gold to every one platinum which seems kind of reasonable ish for a drop you know you buy you know you buy an enter draft for 500 platinum you get 5k gold plus all the cards you got in there uh, okay. as kind of a, a side currency seems to make a little bit of sense yeah i think i mean i, I like to see so like i was saying th there's this is more one where you you definitely have more expertise than me mm -hmm. on so uh i would say take anything i i say with a grain of salt but one one thing i do like to see is that i've seen a number of angel of dawns sell for um i can guess well i know at least two have sold for two hundred thousand gold um, and that currently they're priced, uh, I want to say, uh, in a 1300 platinum range, um, if that goes anything into the equation. So we're saying 200,000 gold and I, that I know of for a fact have sold at that. Mm. Um, but I have a feeling that there's some that have sold for dramatically more, maybe 350,000 gold. Uh, so now we're talking like large increments, and maybe that's not a good example to use because, like you're saying, it's not populated like uh, the Windborn Acolyte is. But um, yeah, I mean, we they don't have as many. So I we've pulled them up now, and they should be hitting the screen hopefully here in a few moments. Uh, mm -hmm. Angel of Dawn right now is listed at in gold uh, a minimum 300k with a buyout of 400k, and then okay. one of them is outrageous at a million gold. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that that is presently outrageous. So yeah. if you want to take the, a look at... The million at, gold is. The, uh, so the 400,000, I don't think is all that far-fetched. It's probably not going to sell, but it's not too far off. So if you take a look at what the effect of that, so you take the amount of gold divided by an average platinum price, and if you take, like, low end. So mm -hmm. actually, I'd say that's it's probably better, I'd say 15 bucks for an Angel of Dawn is not outrageous it's not yeah. preferred but it's not outrageous yeah so if you know you put in your gold bid of three hundred thousand, excuse me and you pay you could pay 1500 platinum you know what ratio that hits at 200 mm. to 1 200 to 1 okay which yeah, also so I mean, happens to randomly match up with the general value of a rathwood alternate art as well yeah. Okay, yeah, I was uh, Rathwood alternate was what I was going to ask about next, and I definitely see um, that. Like, I, if I had to guess, I was going to say it would be somewhere between 160 to one or 200 to one. I I find it really interesting though that there is, um, you know, platinum and gold do have mm -hmm. a direct value uh, relationship with each other. That you know they well, it's people very, are willing to. It's very weird to see it this early yeah. and to see it just beginning to emerge so shortly after the auction house i know it's been actually a major topic of discussion on the forums mm -hmm. uh because i know yas has been leading on the forums a huge discussion about the the difference between and what it would be to convert directly into platinum to gold uh which i doubt we're ever going to see that 
anytime mm -hmm. soon a direct company supported conversion the cards are going no. to be your converter yeah i don't think there's even really any need for them to spend time working on something like that there might there might be a benefit to it for them but mm -hmm. that time uh it took is unnecessary when the, the market will yes. already provide that itself in some way so so it's a uh oh hey look i bought a legionnaire of Gwaine. awesome uh another card down for the set but nice uh, nice you know, it's one of those where what I expected gold to do and where I expected gold to really start getting its value in the PvP space was going to be much more related when you could start getting in that influx of gold when it could do more things for you in-game. You know, when I could expect gold to go in and buy you uh, either little upgrades for your decks inside of the PvE or have other wonderful uses going on, that's kind of what I expected gold to gain value. But mm -hmm. just the ability to go in and roll on your chest on mass has a value to it. Yeah. You know, just yeah. the time-saving value that comes in. Because, you know, they want to upgrade their legendary chest. 30k a pop is kind of rough. You know, essentially, because if an Angel of Dawn sells for 300,000 uh, gold, that's only rolling on 10 primal chests. So that's kind of that's kind of what that's saying. An Angel of Dawn is worth rolling on ten primal chests. Yeah. Then that just that kind of leaves me speechless. But the reason you roll on ten primal chests or ten legendary chests is because you want to get these primal chests stored up for when PVE comes out. Yeah. So there's there's a really interesting thing there. Like I am incredibly interested to know what the ramp up is for what's inside a primal chest because mm -hmm. here you're talking like you you could be saying i mean and, and you might have just said that and i might have spaced out is in a sense when you roll on that primal chest for or that legendary chest i guess is what it is yep. for what thirty thousand gold yep. that that you're paying like three or four bucks whatever uh, off the top of my head you were paying a certain dollar amount to actually roll on that chest yes you are yeah. uh, and there's an equivalent because if you think about, uh, so the fastest way to get to a primal chest is to start with a common chest, uh, or start with a rare chest. I guess, mm -hmm. I guess the fastest way is to start with a rare chest. And what you do with that rare chest is you pay the 8,500, you hit, uh, you happen to hit all of your hearts, so you hit your triple hearts, and mm -hmm. it double upgrades into a primal. That is the fastest way to get to a primal chest. And then it gives you a free roll on top of that because it's like, you've got a primal roll again. Yeah, and well, uh, the primals, I don't know if you can roll the primals. You can, I have I've done one. it. Oh, you can? Oh, because uh, they're it, they're free to roll, right? Yep, they're yeah, free roll. I have one primal where I upgraded a legendary into a primal. Mm. The only one I've ever rolled. Um, so I got pretty lucky there. But uh, I think so... Um, but I wasn't able to roll it because I think it was one of those just flat upgrades. Yeah. Um, getting back to what I was saying though, there's it's definitely really, really intriguing for me to know what is in an uncommon chest versus a common one, or what's in a primal one versus a rare or legendary one, and uh, yeah, I mean, cause and it'll be real. Corey has promised us the world on chests, yeah. and the if anything, you can equate the current value of gold to the promises Corey has made for the value of chests. So, yeah, and, so, and here's an interesting one. On that note, if you're able to sell chests and, you know, you roll that legendary into a primal, you're not, or you're that rare into a primal, and that's not going to happen that often. The primal chests, if, based on how much gold it takes to roll into one, if their mm. contents are um, in line with that, the primal chests are actually going to be worth, you know. They should be a, worth a, lot. a, a nice little penny. Yeah. I um, but I, I do worry a little bit i i am concerned that maybe they're they're not going to have the value that it that matches up with what it takes to roll and maybe they're going to drop mm. the cost of rolling at some point or something like that um that's probably not that valid of a worry i'm sure whatever's in there is going to be some really jc pve equipment that mm -hmm. people really are dying to get or some sleeves that are um impossible oh, to get sleeves. otherwise kind of thing the the problem with the primal though is the sleeves the sleeves need to be rare within the primal pack where if if you get them every time you open a primal the sleeves aren't really going to be worth all that much because you know assume maybe everybody's open to one primal then nobody needs the sleeves anymore so so the uh 
And now one of the other things to notice is that at present you can't put chests, even ro unrolled chests, on the AH. Because yeah. I'm in here, I'm in the inventory now, and I know I've, as we saw, I have plenty of chests. You cannot put one on there. So once you've got your chests, there, you know, that's it. You're done. Um, so that's one a, that's final, a static investment. I don't know if we have too much more to talk about this. One final thing, at least I'll say, is uh, I've been buying up a ton of cards for one gold, even if they're just commons. Um, it seems like it, there's there's not much to lose by doing so, uh, except for the time. That's probably the biggest thing I'm losing because um, it's it is kind of time consuming. Uh, there's not much to lose by doing so, just one gold. Um, but if crafting materials are at least even remotely valuable, uh, I would, and they're worth more than one gold a pop, even for the most common ones, then uh, I'll be in pretty good shape. True that, and that, that what you're doing right there is you're going, my gold investment is worth my PVE investment. Mm -hmm. And there is not a problem with that. In fact, I'm kind of no. I'm going through and doing it right now. Do not yeah, go out and no. outbid me. I'm spending two gold on all of these. The yeah, noble citizenry is mine. Yep. Yeah. So, I, I do find that funny. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll start listing commons at, at 50 gold and try to buy them at one or something. I don't well, know. The, uh, we'll see what nonsense I come up with. Well, and it really depends. So, like, when it comes to all of these commons, you know, these they're things that people are putting up. They're wanting to see if they can get little increments of gold. Uh, and three gold is actually the very lowest amount that you'd ever do for a common. Because what we mm -hmm. ended up seeing happening is that if commons still could not demand the value of platinum that they come in at like three or four cents, they're only mm -hmm. going to sell for gold. Yeah. And so you go, all right, so what is uh, the gold of a common worth? It's going to be worth whatever their crafting material turns out to be. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and that's if the whole market goes buying a common for a penny is not worth my time of going to go buy packs or drafting mm -hmm. so actually being able to buy uh being able to list any commons for a penny right now is probably the highest value you're going to get for your commons yeah uh yeah i've sold a few commons for uh just a couple platinum which is kind of nice i i doubt i'm ever going to be able to sell them any other time so i figured i might as well try um the one last thing i would say is interesting for all of uh, your equations and whatnot mm -hmm. is that right now packs are selling for uh, about 1900 gold I think and if you win a draft you get I think 30,000 it is so you can almost think in some cases that anytime you win a draft you're really rather than getting gold you're getting an extra pack and a half as far as prize payouts go um, and if you look at it strictly that way which works mm -hmm. with all the models um, everything we're seeing there's no reason not to think that because you can you can trade the gold for that if you want so um, looking at the first place and all the rest of the spots your the prize payouts actually are better than they seem to be yeah and let's see uh, so I'm taking a look at current uh, let's take a look at the low end so the low end here aside from the one that I just bid on that I'm sure is going to get sniped for me in the next five minutes uh, the lowest you can bid out on a set one booster pack in gold is uh, 15k right now. Okay. That is the current minimum that's out there, and the okay. high is 19k. You've got it. Looks like you've got a couple bids that are just below 15k, like a 14k right here. So that's not terrible either, <laughs> to be yeah, honest. I mean, I don't know but... if they're going to go for that amount, but because. Really, the reason you want to crack a set one booster pack right now, when you have all of the, uh, when you have a certain sizable amount of collection, is for the rare and the chest. Yeah. And the reason you're going to want to crack the to do the chest is you actually want a common chest to roll for, not upgrading to a legendary, but trying to get all of the, the side alternate arts, the other cards and mm -hmm. stuff, which yeah. is you know kind of painful because i've rolled on huge numbers of chests so far i mean yeah. not as many as uh those who have had the larger packs uh or the larger kickstarter tiers but i've easily rolled uh i've rolled over 200 so far it looks like just uh, yeah. just about 200 chests so far and when you start taking a look at uh kind of the drops from those in some cases i've gotten really lucky but then in other cases i've got a ton of acolotes and i've got a ton of the uh, let's see, I have a huge number of acolytes and I've got a lot of the lightning elemental. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But then when you try to take a look at the other cards themselves, only mm -hmm. end up I've only pulled one water elemental so far. I've only seen one yeah. air elemental. And so and I think there's I don't even know if there's even a legendary one. I no. haven't seen it. Well, it seems like they messed up the rarities on some of this at least. Um but yeah, and and all, all I'm getting at is uh the drafts mm -hmm. like the payouts are much more generous than they they would seem they to be appear. if you're if you're not if you're ignoring gold as a prize. Um and and actually what is it? Second place in the draft is 27,000 gold. So mm -hmm. it actually puts second place much closer to where uh first place is in that case. You're getting two less packs but the the gold is uh significantly the closer in, in packs. Yeah. Yeah, so. the one of the things I think I've noticed when it comes to uh actually probably the better way to say that is uh Boom! Brain just blew up. It went five different directions at once and left me in the middle of nowhere. Uh, oh. Yeah, well, it, have... it was going to be some terribly awesome insight, and then it went away. All right. Shh. Well, uh, to wrap things up, while we, while we we have a couple topics left to talk about. Yeah. Um, for, uh, we were talking about drafting. Um, I might as well put this in real quick before we uh, crack open a pack or roll on HS or anything. I... Is, I don't think I've told you about my curse. You have, oh a, yeah, you have a curse. Tell me yeah. about the curse. Okay, so the curse is this: is uh, I really wanted to get a hat trick and draft, get three back-to-back -back draft wins. Okay. And it hasn't happened yet, and I've had so many times where I've got draft win, draft win. So I was ready to get the hat trick, and every like that. So that's happened. I don't know. Uh, at this point, probably I was going to say a dozen times, but it's happened more because that was kind of before. Um, I even came out here to Chicago, so it's probably happened maybe 20 times or so, where I've gotten the back-to-back the -back wins, and then every single time that's happened, I immediately lose round one of the very next draft. Oh, so that's my curse is So right now, I've, I've won the last two drafts I've done. I won one this morning, mm -hmm. uh, and one last night, and maybe I'll, I'll draft again sometime soon, and I can take another shot at breaking the curse, but uh, the curse is, has held pretty, pretty tight grip over me so far so i don't know well you know and i think your curse is the curse isn't necessarily that you're not winning the third one your curse is that you're losing in round one in round right? one yeah yeah because yeah. at least if you hit round two you still get the 10k <laughs> mm -hmm. associated it wouldn't with. be so bad all right let's go yeah. ahead let's go ahead and get this uh pack or crack the pack crack this pack crack this pack all right so oh nice uh so we'll we'll watch this come up here. So that you know. So taking a look at the commons and uncommons. Uh, oh, well, I I guess I kind of have to wait for that to load up here. That's that's terrible. Um, so we have. Oh. Are right, you seeing a legendary there? Yeah, I really want to flip the legendary. I'm going to flip the legendary. Okay. What do you get? <laughs> Are you not going to click on it? You haven't clicked on it yet. I for just me. I, ha I haven't clicked on it yet for you, and it's going to be hitting okay. up in just a moment. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, you got comet strike. Yeah. Oh, get, get wrecked. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, are we going to take the comet strike and draft? No. no. Absolutely not. It's it's one of the few legendaries that you just you look at it and you're like, well, that's a oh. pass. Uh, especially value drafting wise, you're going to grab it because it's a legendary. If you don't have your four of yet, but even if you get one. Uh, they, their auction house value that I've seen so far is about. It's a, it rivals about the value of another pack, not a not a store bought booster pack, but it's rivaling about the value of a uh, an auction house pack at the moment. Yeah. Quig and Sane in chat here, it better uh, salvage for some decent crafting <laughs> materials. materials. <laughs> and I gotta agree, like uh, yeah, yeah, I you think better get a ton of hexing gems out of this sucker. Something. Um, but let's talk about the pack as far yeah. as draft goes. I, I would say, before we get into it, is that mm -hmm. it's a very easy pack uh, to pick from. Uh, but the runner-ups after that easy pick are more interesting. But let's hear, hear your thoughts. Alright, so starting with the uncommon. So Blinding Light is not a terrible fog effect. But it, I, gener yeah, I, I mm -hmm. don't generally first pick the Blinding Light. Because it's just not kind of the style that I play. 
Uh, I do like the infusion of diamond for when you're actually building life drain, but I'm not super awesome on that. I found a lot of people have done really well with the uh, shamed gladiator. And even though he's dealing that two damage back to you mm -hmm. with the right draft picks, that could actually become an asset. So yeah, the shamed gladiator not is not a, not a bad pick either. Um, my initial with this setup, I'm, I'm pulled to four cards. I'd say, uh, okay. the four cards I'm pulled to is I'm pulled to inquisition because okay. it's, I, I've been a pretty consistent blood player. I'm mm -hmm. pulled to Boulder Brute because of the utility that pr provided with its shard. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pulled to Counter Magic because Counter Magics make people cry, and yeah, I'm yeah. and I'm pulled to Gem Crazed Berserker because the utility that you get from uh, putting on the right gems on the Gem Crazed Berserker. Yeah, Gem Crazed Berserker is definitely good. Um, uh, and but, it, uh, to me, it's hard to pick between those. Okay. Uh, if I didn't go with what I normally favor, I've had just huge amounts of success running blood paired with uh, another shard and blood really paired mm -hmm. with wild has been really good for me so my first step here Siren is probably here. sorry i should mute my mic for a second it's getting loud yeah. okay uh i'd say uh inquisition is my preferred one in this pack because of my affinity for blood which makes me sound far more like a vampire when i say that out loud uh, so I'd say if I was going to first pick on this one, and since I know I'm not grabbing the comic tr comic strike, I comic the comic strike. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'd say I'd probably go with the Inquisition on this one because I okay. don't see anything else that I find super balmy. I don't mm -hmm. see anything that makes me scream. I love this removal, and Inquisition is just a great attack on the hand. Okay, so. Um... If, if I was going to give my two cents about it, uh, all the cards you listed that were strong are definitely strong and are the, kind of the runner-ups here. The Gem Craze Berserker, the Counter Magic, the Boulder Brute, um, and the Inquisition are, are probably... Um, I would say I'm not that big a fan of taking the Inquisition first pick. Um, and and while I really like playing it for the exact same reasons that I'm sure you do, it's really strong. It can take out the one card that you're worried about from your opponent's hand. Bomb is... it's. In the late game, it's a bad top deck if your opponent has no cards in hand or if they mm. only have a resource. Um, there's those, and it's kind of a card that, well, because it's because of that late game situation, and because of the double threshold that you're not always able to play it turn two, even when you mm. have double blood in your hand in the opening, you want to lay down a different a diamond card or something um, per se, and so then you're not playing the Inquisition till turn three. Uh, that combined with it not being the best late game card makes you want to not play multiples of it. Um, and picking it up early might end up uh, being able to get them late because they're not that great in multiples. Still, having two in your deck or one in the main, one on the sideboard, which is what I really like to do is one in the main, one on the sideboard, uh, has worked really well for me. So I I like the Inquisition here too, like you're saying. Uh, Counter Magic, I think, is underplayed currently. I've, I think at most in all the drafts I've done, including Alpha, Okay, I'm going to take that back. Um, there's one exception to it, and I'll say it. At most, I've only had one card ever counter magic, which is amazing to me. Like, I just don't seem to be playing against people who are playing it, or maybe there's just not <laughs> that many totally people. You've totally not maybe played me yet, my, because there was one yeah. draft where I counter magic someone three times. Yeah. I drafted all so, three, and they were in main board. <laughs> I, I've played counter magic a bunch of times, though, and in the same sense, and I would say it's very, very good. It's, it's easy to uh, make it work for you, because... Mm -hmm. A lot of limited games go really long. Not all of them do, but a lot of them do. And the four drops are the ones that are important. So hopefully you're on the play when you have the counter magic. You're able to stop their four drop, mm -hmm. um, or that they miss a resource. And maybe if you're on the draw, you're, you're all right. Which is you know either way, they're both pretty common situations. Um, the exception to the counter magic one is that playing against Clint, buddy of mine, uh, in draft, he had like a bunch of windborne acolytes, and I'm oh, I'm, wow. I'm ashamed to say that I actually lost against this. Yeah. It was just like all Windborn Acolytes and Counter Magics and Buccaneers and or maybe not even that, maybe it was just time ripples, because the the Buccaneers are good. So mm -hmm. it was it was something that was bad. It was a bad deck and we both agreed it was a terrible, terrible deck and he totally blew me out with it. It was just I never was able to get anything on the board. Um, and the Windborn Acolytes eventually actually killed me. Amazingly, twenty turns later. He had a couple <laughs> of times, so it wasn't that long. But it was that that got pretty ridiculous and out of hand. Um, so going back to the picks though. 
is my pick is Boulder Brute. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a couple intricacies about this pack is that taking a blood card, you're still leaving um, three other blood cards in the pack, none, none of which are stellar. So some, at least one of them is going to wheel. And they're all cards that I'm pretty happy playing. I've actually been liking Shadow Cove Witch a lot lately. Uh, what's up, Nero? Uh, how's it going? I'm just saying hi in chat hey, there. Hey, Nero. And um, so the blood uh, is an option in that sense. You know something's going to wheel. And um, in general, this is kind of a weak pack too. Like, yeah. Uh, there's nothing amazing about it, and most of the cards that are going to come back, like, when this comes back around, the cards that are going to be remaining are mostly going to be trash cards, just because um, the pack is so weak. So in that sense, that's something to keep in mind. I'm get, I would definitely take the Boulder Brute, I just think it's the most powerful card, mm -hmm. and it comes with the benefit that you're, you're cutting a color completely from the pack. So you're kind of showing a signal to the person you're passing this to, they hopefully didn't open Holy some bomby uh, wild bad card, and then oh, snap, that we way. Just follow. You, you what? Oh, we just I gotta, gotta follow. follow. Go. Sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. Nice. <laughs> I thought you said a fiddler. I was like, like crap. Um, Thank you for following, Nero. Yeah, going to the wild is, um, you know, it, it's it's a strong pick here. I think because you're cutting it, and hopefully your pack two is gonna pay off. Hopefully, if you really live the dream, you're gonna be able to um, cut. Sapphire as well in the following packs mm -hmm. along with it and you can have those flying 4-4 four, four spell shields that just win games on their own and Nero's uh, saying the same as the 4-4 four, four shield brute is just yes. insane like it's so bomby for a common it's incredibly powerful so um, yeah boulder brute is a, a really great card yeah uh, it's but now granted you also have a tendency to just love boulder brutes you've loved boulder brute since yeah. you've seen boulder brute you said this card yeah. is going to own and draft and you've also been correct I will add yeah. Uh, and the thing, it's it's generally tough for me to go between the Boulder Brute and the Inquisition. The And I'll explain some of the reason for that pick since we have had a couple people come in. Uh, Blood has turned out really well for uh, for me, and it's really tough for mm -hmm. me to do for the uh, Boulder Brute versus the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I have any time that I can get two Inquisitions into a Blood Draft deck, it has mm -hmm. done very very well for me uh yeah like if i just tracked every single one of my tournament winning draft decks it's had one mm -hmm. to two inquisitions a couple of them have had three uh and it's just been major denial being able to hit on the turn three seeing what they've got then hitting them again on turn six when they've had a refresh in their hand sure. and just doing denial uh down the board because the way you get rid of a four four spell sheet boulder brute is inquisition and counter magic <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's kind of funny that they're all in there, and that's totally true. Uh, the other one is sometimes you can actually it. A lot of the other way to get rid of Boulder Brutes is usually double blocking with like mm -hmm. two two fours or something like that, and you make the trade, and hopefully you don't have a trick or you have a trick in response. Yeah, um, but let's be honest. If you're but, running Boulder Brute, then you're looking yeah. for those easy tricks out of wild, and a yeah. lot of time those tricks uh, they don't always wheel, but they are not picked first. Yeah, so you can you can first pick this boulder brute and then you'll see uh, uh, wild aura come around or you'll see uh, wild aura. I've first picked wild aura a couple times. I haven't first picked wild aura a couple times. There's some times that I've wanted to, but those have also been the ones I had yeah. barely terrible decks. Not not a lot of times, but I've, I've once or twice. Uh, but going back to the Inquisition, yeah, I really like it. Um, the what it has going for it is, and it's actually the same thing that boulder brute has going for it as well is. The card alone has the potential to win the game for you. Um, less so in the Inquisition's case, or less indirectly maybe, but it definitely does have the, the potential to just win the game on its own. If you're playing against a slower deck that relies on um, fewer win conditions, that its troops are either uh, mostly weak and then a couple really strong troops or something like that, or, it, or it's a hand where they were really relying on having turn two or three removal potentially, but that was one of the only removal cards in their deck or hand, and you were able to get rid of it early. You can just run away with the game, and that's what Inquisition has to go for, yeah. Uh, and it's also, for instance, Inquisition, best kills to Talca, killing mm -hmm. Zoltog. Uh, it's really good at taking care of those orcs that are just heavily mean to you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best uses I found for it is... Uh, killing options and essentially forcing my opponent into shard drought 
Because mm-hmm. the way, you know, uh, if you haven't had a chance to do this yet yourself, here's a fun way to do it. So you take a look at what your opponent has going for them. You take a look at what uh, what they can currently play. And if the early turns that what they can play looks like it's going to change your board state significantly, uh, it may be better to take that, especially if you know mm-hmm. you've got other Inquisitions or you happen to have drawn a couple of them. Uh, you want to take away their early play for board position, and then if you have a second one in hand, then you take the bomb. So that way you deny the board position, you know they play a shard to reduce the card, and then your second Inquisition comes around to destroy. Uh, I've had that work for me several times, especially when I've uh, had really heavily blood, uh, blood-based blood decks. But other than that, just, you know, it's the same. I love Inquisition like I love a good corpse fly. Yep. It, you know, yep. corpse fly comes in just together. because they, sure. you know, the corpse fly pulls it out of the hand, it's removal before it hits the board it's it's just sometimes it's amazing to me how much more powerful that is versus mill because yeah. if you think about I mill think... mill pulls the option from the deck but it's just it's just so mind rippingly fun when you pull it from their hand you're like i made you choose from all your good options so i'm not so sad the the last thing i would say here is i, I think my takeaway at least is yeah i'm picking boulder brute and I don't think Inquisition is my second and maybe even third card in the pack. And and the main reason is, at least in my experience, I've been able to pick them up late pretty easily. And by late, I mean like, I don't know, 7 to 10, 10th pick. It's uh, been 50-50, I agree. Sometimes the, I see them, sometimes I don't. The Gem Craze Berserker is also really, really yes. good. Like, it, it can take away games. It really demands removal. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, in a lot of kind of the, the aggro cards that take away games on their own, which it is, uh, most of them die to Zared Venom Scorn, which is one of, is probably my favorite champion. So uh, he um, is. I've definitely seen him pretty heavily played. Uh, yeah. I, I will not deny, but almost every the other champion I've seen really heavily played is the uh, the human champion from uh, Ruby as well. What's his name? Yeah. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But the Lionel one that gives Flynn? Him, yeah, Lionel Flynn has also been pretty heavily played. I see him and yeah. uh, his deck go down and like, oh god, I need yeah. to draw my removal. Oh god, I need to draw my removal. Yeah, so I mean, Lionel's good with the Berserker, mm-hmm. and Zared's good against it is what I was getting at. Um, but, oh man, like, it's just so easy to blow somebody out, though, who's playing that Lionel champ with a repel. Like, it, True. It, Unless, of course, of you have Lionel with the Boulder Brute. Oh, you there just, you go. You just drop it down. Yeah. You're, running a, uh, you're running a tricolor deck. Put yep. Spell Shield Boulder Brew with Lionel Flynn. Swing, better, better, better. Yep. That's Alrighty, probably yeah. really terrible. So. Do not take that advice. That is bad advice, kids. Oh, no, uh, playing tricolor decks is, is actually good advice. I, I do no, it no, all no, time, not, not playing sure. tricolor. Yeah. Doing that version yeah. of tricolor is probably oh, a yeah, bad no, idea. Oh, yeah, I agree. That's probably not the best. But yeah, tricolor, do that all the time because that wins games. Uh, so we did our, our pick of the day kind of thing. Yes, um, and we have a rare chest. It couldn't have given me a common chest. No. How do you. How do you we see have, what chest you got? After you close the pack out, it pops up a chest afterwards. Oh, I guess I never even noticed that in the background, or I just haven't opened packs in a while. I think I've ever only actually opened five packs, so um, there's that. Oh, but, uh, well, that's what you get for not knowing. Until then, let's go ahead and roll. Let's Maybe uh, we'll well get before cool. we start going, why don't we? Uh, are we gonna do a giveaway today? Yes, we'll go ahead and give. Yeah. A, we'll do a giveaway. <laughs> Why don't we get that uh, going? Cause... Yeah, so let's go ahead uh, and let us give away some perks. Okay, so we want to... We're going to open up a raffle. Okay. So you need to enter an exclamation mark raffle. And we're going to give away draft pack today, right? Uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Sure. This is... Uh... Draft pack up for grabs is going to be, uh, I think it gives you the, the, basically the plat waved or whatever and the three packs so you can go play in a draft. Yep. And you can, you can hopefully get that boulder group. Ah, oh, thanks, Nero. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to get back in the habit of, um, of doing these more regularly. We need to figure out what day it's going to be. Yes. I was kind of leaning towards Tuesday or Wednesday. Those are probably the better days for Yes, me. I, I like Wednesday as well, but someone made themselves indisposed yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So, we'll be back at it soon, yes. though. And it's good to be doing it back-to-back weeks. Holy Hopefully we will shit, you geeks get the trifecta going here. We oh. won't have the, cur- 
the curse won't affect the the general's tent. Yes, we we need to go ahead and uh, you know hit that triple on the general's tent one of these days. We, yeah. We've been good at back to back. We need to get back to back to back. But in any case, so we got a windborne acolyte. Yay! I can put that up for a hundred platinum. Uh, so in this case, we could say eighty five hundred gold was worth one hundred platinum. That's mm -hmm. an eighty five to one ratio for this roll. Uh, Holy shit, you geeks are bad. So in any case, but one uh, that's the other if your acolyte actually sells. <laughs> but uh, sure. That is true. The acolyte does have to sell first. So now one other thing to mention is that as soon as we hit, uh, do pardon the phone, but as soon as we hit uh, 100 followers, either on that one or either on, uh, if I can speak Wait. properly, uh, especially with the phone, uh, Either on that cast or the following cast, we're going to be giving away a beta key and draft pack combo. So that uh, way, is essentially it's kind of like the the new player support. So mm -hmm. and we're not actually all that many followers away either. Let's see, because we just had a couple people uh, jump in. We had let's see, so uh, forward and Quagon as well as uh, Arius all just followed. And that's gone in us uh, awesome. a little bit clo uh, closer. That's put us at 88. So 12 more follows. Yeah, 12, and uh, then we hit the, the 100 followers. And we're going to give away that double. Uh, okay. And then because we also had them. So like forward that. hit the raffle. Uh, Irish Batosai. Awesome player, by the way. I think I've played you in draft. Uh, if I remember correctly, I believe I've played Irish Batosai in draft. Uh, yeah. He's in the raffle in the moment too. Fyrock, I love that name, Fyrock. Reminds me of uh, the name of one of my buddies. Uh, so just in any case, you know, because if you think about like the value that comes from the the uh, the draft pack, so you're getting mm -hmm. your ticket and you're getting your three packs. So already for 100 platinum, you can take your three packs and go do a draft. And if you if you're pretty decent at draft from other games or you know, you're decent at draft already from having, you know, uh, several hex drafts under your belt. You know, there's a good chance you're going to be walking away with uh, two, three, or five packs out of that one. You know, just making it a second round gives you two packs, which mm -hmm. is already pretty yeah. cool. Uh, so, and, mean, then you, and then you've got a draft ticket. So the fun part is, is that the draft packs now, you can start with your draft ticket, hit round two, uh, or, you know, if you win your dra first draft, you'll get 20k gold, five packs, that should be enough to sell enough from two of your packs to get your next 100 platinum to enter into your next draft. Mm -hmm. And if you're that awesome, you could go infinite today! Yeah, not to mention the gold, which we were talking about earlier. You know, the like gold yeah. provides a lot of value. So In fact, you can yeah, use you some can, of your gold yeah. to go buy a pack or two. That, that would be quite the stretch for somebody who's never played Hex before to just go infinite off their first draft that we gave them. That'd be pretty sweet. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. All right. And even if it's not just infinite, just to yeah. to have someone you know just start out their collection because it's really powerful with your drafts to build the collection, especially yeah. when you're keeping track of it because you know your first set of drafts that you're going through, uh, some of those cards may not seem like they're perfect for draft, but they may be valuable enough for your uh, your standard uh, constructed collection going through. And even if you only get three rares. Those are three rares you didn't have before. And sometimes I've walked out of drafts getting, you know, drafting nine different rare cards and using like four of them in the draft and then going on yeah. to get like second and, in the draft. And, you know, I like we've been talking uh, kind of like the whole thread of General's Tent lately has been, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been talking my drafting strategy versus maybe your initial drafting strategy. It's yes. changed a little bit now that you have your collection built up. But um, and I was definitely critical on, uh, you know, playing to win versus just Playing to build your collection, uh, and in mm -hmm. in that sense, I'm, I'm probably not very a fair criticism because that's what you wanted to do, yep. um, and and if, if that's what you're enjoying doing, then there's no criticism. Uh, if we're looking at strict competitive play, that's different, mm -hmm. um, but we're looking at them differently. Uh, but what I was going to get back to is that it's entirely possible that you know we're we're going to just say that I've probably won more on average mm -hmm. um, drafting the way I've drafted. Uh, but it's entirely possible that even while doing so, that the rares and whatnot that you've been able to pull actually are more value than than everything else with the au auction house. It wouldn't be that mm -hmm. hard to find out, and that's kind of interesting to think about. So. Yeah, it's a because here's the the 
we covered this a little bit last time, but since we have a few mm-hmm. new people in here today, it's worth uh, kind of revisiting in the short form. What oftentimes happens when you start your early value drafting, and especially if you don't have Kickstarter tiers, uh, early value drafting, it's basically called put down 20 bucks now, go in, spend about uh, half of it on boosters, and get some, you know, s- squeak out some value from the auction house on boosters, get about 10 boosters or so. And then go in and try to draft as many times as you can and pick everywhere you can, uh, pick commons and uncommons to try to win the draft. And, uh, you know, push for those second spots, push to get into uh, round two, push to get into round three, because every one of those is just a value for you uh, when you're going in. And, you know, you don't necessarily, and every time that you get a playset, set, every, every card above the play set that you draft, put right back on the auction house to get more platinum to fund it going forward and just build them up that way because the what ends up happening is that after a certain number of drafts uh you end up really getting the common play set very quickly you get really far in your uncommon play set uh crazy quick a lot of the time and then uh like right now i am always keep my drafts up here you know with a little bit of auction house stuff going on i went from having uh you know maybe 30 percent of my collection complete after doing my primal packs and a couple uh regular uh cracking in the pack open to Mm. you know something a lot more spectacular than that i'm now you know total number of cards i'm about 92 percent complete for all play sets you know and that's after uh i am actually i am one draft away from my 40th draft so my next draft yes. is my 40th draft cool cool and so and Pixel's in here saying he just drafts a living totem and it'll probably pay for his draft on its own yep it might not quite because well actually i think living totem's going pretty high and it's definitely one of the best uh rares in the set, you're going to see a lot of them in Constructed, yep. and in going back to the big Constructed tournaments, uh, I was playing Living Totem, and I faced quite a few of them as well. It's a very powerful card, and here you are playing right now, and you got a Living Totem going. It is yep. definitely a powerful there, and it definitely, you know, it gets the price it gets because it's good. So. Yeah, and it's, you know, it, it, blah, 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 blah. Living Totem made a heck of a splash on the Hex DCG Pro, Pro Series. It's a Diamond All-Star. It splashes into other decks really well. Uh, when we talked about in the earliest general sense, you know, what's going to kind of be a chase rare, uh, mm-hmm. this actually hits a lot of the chase rare quota. It's only got a single threshold. <laughs> it's an early cost. It can fit into aggro decks. It allows you to maintain and plan around your hand strategy and just dump in cards, being able to plan out what you keep and what you don't keep. Uh, you know, it puts in a lot of good value very quickly. Uh and especially when you're running uh, Palamedes as your champion, you just run through and you go kill stuff. Like right now, turn four, my totem's running as a four-four, and it's going to go swing at the face. You know, I, and this is just a quick diamond deck I whipped up, you know, right here on the stream in two minutes, no testing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Granted, I'm also facing the AI, which is kind of like kicking a puppy, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah. You know this kind of opening can happen, you know, oh, they got a murder, that's fine, I've got a spirit walker and a uh, noble citizenry sitting right here just waiting to go with two solitary exiles waiting to kill something like a righteous paladin. Alrighty. So, uh, alright, do you think, uh, yeah, let's take a look and see how we are doing on our, because we're doing this to kill a little bit of time and give people some uh, opportunity to... Yeah, we should have started the raffle a little bit early. We're yeah. running last time at this point. So. All right, so let's think, go ahead. Should we go ahead and close it? Yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and close it. So we'll close up the raffle. So the raffle is closed. There are no more entries. And we are going to draw. He Actually, this is pretty cool. Announce in chat. Fyrock, oh, you Fyrock. are our lucky winner, my friend. do 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 so right. after the the broadcast is over, uh, one of us will message you on Twitch and send you over the code for a draft in game. Hopefully, you already have a beta key. Um, if not, you can hold on to the the thing for a little bit and still redeem it later. But this will you'll do in a little code redemption spot, and it will enable you to do a draft for free, which is pretty sweet. 
I like the, the, the fire rock. It makes me think of like an eye rock that's on fire, like, you know, the car. That's just my picture. But yes. uh, yeah, congratulations. So, um, yay, power grats. Here, let's get on the. Of- well, on the wrap up note, um, mm-hmm. we'll do our regular spiel as, you know, tune in on Twitter if you don't already follow both of us. Uh, Mocog is at Hux, uh, <laughs> at, <laughs> at Hex Hunter Mocog, and I'm at Function Fails. Um, that's usually the best way to see when we're going to do the next episode of General's Tent. We're trying to do them a little bit more regularly, so you can stay tuned with us on Twitter, and uh, we'll let you know when we're doing giveaways and when we're putting out videos and other fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Also, you can listen to some of our banter about hex-related things and other goings on. Um, other than that, though, uh, be sure to subscribe to Mopox's channel because, like you mentioned, we're doing the giveaway pretty soon. And he's streaming Holy somewhat shit, often, you geeks so you are can badass. keep him company and, and hear what he has to say. What else do we have to, to pitch Wait, before we do wrap and up? And Fitzo followed as I was dancing. That made me happy, chair dancing. Uh, you know, again, Twitter, fantastic. YouTube, please do. That's where all of our archived amounts are going on. Because if you've tried, Twitch's archival system is a bit terrible. Uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, different deck texts and commentary go up on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can reach both of us on the forums. You can reach Function at Function Fails, right? Yep, yep. And you can reach uh, me as Mocog uh, on the forums as well as in-game. Don't hesitate to just shoot me a friend invite. I'll probably auto-add you uh, just because I like having as many friends as possible. It's always good to have uh, wonderful people uh, going around because we're all a Hex family at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's been fun talking to people in the game, so that's been pretty cool. Um, so oh, until then... And, or, well, ahead. actually, uh, speaking of family is... Although we are about to wrap up, Twitch is still going. I just got a little email that uh, Neo just started streaming. So if um, you're planning on staying in Twitch and actually watching some people play Hex rather than just uh, commentary about it, is Neo's about to start, and I'm not sure what he has planned for tonight. But uh, he's a very good streamer, and he uh, provides a lot of fun videos and stuff, and he does a lot of giveaways. So And oh my uh, god, was... he knows how to live the dream. Have you, did you watch yeah. his dream video? All right. Yeah, he, that, that was he, he comes good. in with that, Reginald, that kind of turn three, switch, comes in, turn four... Auto win, you're like, that's statistically improbable, sir. Good win. And he happened in draft on top of all of it. He had yeah, everything in his that's hand. Strange. It was the hex dream. Uh, so in any case, but yeah, go ahead and uh, go check out Neo. And it's spelled N-E-0, right? Infamous yeah, Neo? Yeah, it's Infamous Neo on Twitch. You can just click uh, Mocha Sex Shards of Fate thing under the title. And it'll pop you right over there. Uh, but yeah, Zero, I spend way too much time on the farms. But uh you know. but, but yeah, oh, come yeah. back, check us out again. We're shooting for next Wednesday, which is... Check Handy Dandy Calculator on the phone. So next Wednesday is the 2nd, so a couple days before yep. 4th of the July. Uh, and hopefully work. we'll be getting uh, the archive of this episode up on YouTube as well, in case you uh, just came in late and you want to see a little bit of what we talked about before you came in. Yep. Alrighty, guys, so... You have a good one. Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you later.